So I want to thank the American people for the extraordinary honor of being elected your 47th president and your 45th president. Donald Trump has once again won the U.S. presidency. What does that mean for the nation's future? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. America has voted and Donald Trump will be the 47th president of the United States. His historic win makes him only the second Republican presidential candidate since 1992 to win not only the Electoral College but also the popular vote. With a new Trump administration on the way to the White House, what does this mean for the country's domestic and foreign policies? We begin with this report from CGTN's Nitsa Soledad Perez in West Palm Beach, Florida. Now, Trump supporters here in Florida are elated, but many across the nation are still in shock processing the results from last night. Uh, the president-elect Donald J. Trump had a decisive win with 292 electoral votes, likely getting the popular vote, and the Republicans also secured the U.S. Senate. This is an astonishing political comeback for a man who was uh, accused of trying to uh, change the latest, the last election. Now, he managed to tap into the fears and frustrations about the economy and illegal immigration to defeat Vice President Kamala Harris. This is a deeply divided nation, and after speaking to many Trump supporters uh, throughout uh, this election cycle, what appealed to them was his message of securing the border, mass deportations, and controlling inflation, lowering from grass, gas prices to grocery prices. They also embrace that message of restoring America's manufacturing power and removing the country from global conflicts and entanglements. During his speech last night, Trump said that he received a mandate from the U.S. electorate because uh, he won the popular vote, the Senate, and likely the House of Representatives. He also said that MAGA, Make America Great Again, is the most or the greatest political movement in U.S. history. He thanked those battleground states, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, for getting him that victory that he received last night. Now, he also talked about Elon Musk. He said a new star was born. Uh, Musk will lead this new government efficiency panel that could potentially dismantle the Department of Education, uh, the Census Bureau, among other government entities. Now, he also uh, had a message of unity. He wasn't as antagonistic as he, as he usually is. Let's take a listen. Frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. There's never been anything like this in this country, and maybe beyond. And now it's going to reach a new level of importance because we're going to help our country heal. We're going to help our country heal. We have a country that needs help, and it needs help very badly. We're going to fix our borders. We're going to fix everything about our country. And now, what really caught my attention is that uh, President-elect Donald Trump sees himself as the savior of the United States. He said that many people tell him that God saved him for a reason after that assassination attempt in Butler, Pennsylvania. And that was because he is here to save America and restore its greatness. Nitsa Soledad Perez, CGTN America, West Palm Beach, Florida. The Democratic candidate and U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris conceded on Wednesday afternoon speaking at Howard University in Washington. The outcome of this election is not what we wanted, not what we fought for, not what we voted for, but hear me when I say, hear me when I say, the light of America's promise will always burn bright. Okay, let's talk about election 2024. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us here 
in the studio is Imani Cheers. She is an associate professor of digital storytelling at George Washington University. From Georgia, we're joined by Bill Crane. He is a political analyst and columnist from Philadelphia. Craig Green joins us. He is professor of law at Temple University. And from San Diego, California, we're joined by Jaden Horney. He is a political analyst. Welcome to all of you to the show. Jaden Horney, let me start with you. Donald Trump is now the president-elect after that resounding uh, election victory. You know, we've been talking about this election for months, Jaden. We've been speculating on who would win, how big the margin would be, how they would win, etc. Now it's over. Donald Trump has won. Let's listen to a little bit more of what he had to say at that uh, victory speech. This will forever be remembered as the day the American people regained control of their country. So, Jaden, it's the day after. What are your thoughts on how the election panned out? Well, I think it's a, it comes as a great surprise for, for many people, though for those of us that uh, spend some time out in the provinces, uh, you know, so to speak, and, and meeting with real people, uh, you kind of understand the angst that has been in the American electorate um, when you live in a wealthy you know, suburban or metropolitan area, um, it's easy to say that the economy is working, um, that prices aren't that much of a concern when you have a six-figure salary. But to the overwhelming majority of the American people, um, and obviously a, uh, you know, majority of those that voted, um, they were not content with the status quo. We saw that in the exit polls yesterday, and they made their voices heard. They want someone who is going to change um, what they have seen is the wrong direction of the country for the last four years. And Donald Trump truly has an opportunity here to uh, do that uh, with a likely House majority, narrow, but likely, uh, and a Senate majority. Um, he will have a second chance at a trifecta to enact the change that the American people have now given him an electoral mandate for. What that looks like, that remains to be seen. Um, but I believe it's something that many, even moderate Democrats, uh, can hold out some cautious hope and optimism for. Uh, a policy that puts the United States first, that ensures our trade is fair, and ensures that the world is more free and safer. Hey, Mani, obviously there'll be quite a bit of self-examination going on among Democrats right now to find out what went wrong, why did Kamala Harris lose this election. But here's one thing, from the economy to Gaza to immigration, Vice President Harris in many respects failed to articulate her own policies. She failed to separate herself from her boss, President Biden. In fact, on one popular television show here in the United States, she was asked what she would do differently, and she said, quote, there is not a thing that comes to mind. That was really a missed opportunity, wasn't it? There's been many missed opportunities, yeah. but I think it's really important for us to remember in these reflective moments yeah. that Kamala Harris had 90 days, Donald Trump has yes. been campaigning for nine years. And so I think it's really important when you talk about a candidate who only was given the opportunity in, in July. Of, of this year, really in, in August, where it was official that she was the Democratic nominee. And it's really important that we, we look at that. There wasn't time to differentiate herself. There wasn't mm -hmm. time to, to set her own policies. But I think it's also really important, as the Democrats will take some time, hopefully, to examine, to explore, um, and to really try to explain some of these exit polls. I think it's important that we know that the reality is um, the, the promise of, of the policy policies that America has mm -hmm. hold and held so of high regard uh, for our politics no longer exist anymore. Yeah. And so the candidate um, that we used to be looking at character, we used to be looking at everything from experience, educational levels, um, someone who had empathy, all of those are, are out the window. And that is something that I think is also really yeah. a, a larger conversation. Imani, uh, Donald Trump, he won the key swing states. He swept the board in the key swing states. But look at the you know, some of the key demographics that he won. He won the 18 to 29 year old men by 13 points. Among black voters, Trump grew that share of his vote by 15%. White women voted for him. How did you see this outcome? 
predictable, yeah. to be completely honest. Uh, once I saw that it didn't matter, again, about qualifications, when we look at, we can go back to 2016 with Hillary Clinton. Right. And when I realized that, again, arguably one of the most qualified candidates that we've seen in the history of um, presidential uh, elections to, to be denied, in particular, by white women, white men in right. particular, who did not feel so. So America has, and what we will um, need to grapple with is, is our, our issue of patriarchy and sexism. And I think that tends to outweigh mm -hmm. um, our inherent issue of racism, which is which is always um, an issue in, in this country. But we also have to remember, we look at, you know, he'll be the 47th uh, president of the United States. The first 13 presidents of the United States um, were individuals who, who owned other people. They, they yes. were slave owners. Sure. And so when I think of where we are now with someone who is a, you know, convicted felon um, and has all of these other... Um, real challenges um, in his history that it's really par for the course. Right. Okay. Let's go to Georgia. Let's go to Bill Crane. Bill, good to see you. Um, let's talk about Georgia. It was one of those key swing states that we're talking about. Uh, it went for Trump, but really it was a tale of two states, wasn't it? I mean, if we look at the, if we look at Fulton County, for instance, which is where the Atlanta metropolitan area is, um, Kamala Harris did really well there. And she, she scored 72% of the vote there. But as soon as you get outside that metropolitan area, that's where Trump scored. Um, so how did you see it? As you said, Arlen, we have Metro Atlanta, which is a 20-county region. About half of those counties tend to vote Democratic, and most of them did so for Joe Biden four years ago. And uh, Vice President Harris essentially matched the vote in percentages, in some cases surpassed, in those core counties of Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, and Gwinnett, which I know would be foreign to your viewers. But what didn't happen was those surrounding red areas, uh, a lot of secondary population centers and rural areas that doubled their turnout, doing something the GOP has not traditionally been able to do in Georgia, which is identify and turn out their vote in advance of Election Day. They use some outside organizations to do that. And speaking to the point you made a moment ago, when you look at, you drill down, and both exit poll data and the voter registration data going in on early voting, African-American percentage of the vote in the state of Georgia since 2016 has been between 31 and 33 percent, with their percent of the population of the state of Georgia somewhere around 28 percent. In this contest, for any number of reasons, their percentage of the total vote was 26 percent. When you've got 5.2 million votes being cast, every one of those percentage points that doesn't show up in any demographic category is about 50,000 votes. So uh, President-elect Trump won Georgia by, and they're still tabulating absentee ballots and overseas military ballots, by about 160, 170,000 votes, not a small margin, and a greater margin than uh, Brian Kemp beat Stacey Abrams in our last election contest here. I was expecting it to be a little wider margin based on what we'd seen in early voting. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Vice President Harris ran a commendable campaign, but as we said, there are a lot of missed opportunities, and I think both of the candidates, for different mm. reasons, are pretty deeply flawed. All right. Craig Green, good to see you as well. Uh, you know, as we heard from Imani just a moment ago, uh, Donald Trump has a lot of personal issues that he will be facing uh, as he takes office. Um, and one of those, of course, is the fact that he's facing a multitude of legal challenges. I mean, we've got that hush money case, so-called hush money case in New York. And in fact, sentencing is going to be passed uh, in a few weeks later this month uh, in New York. Um, he could be sentenced to time in prison. but. How do you think these legal cases are going to be resolved? So the legal cases, I think, are, are going to go away pretty quickly. I think there's uh, reporting that Jack Smith and the federal cases, that is one in D.C., uh, one in um, uh, Florida, uh, already arranging to have those cases dismissed. The Department of Justice uh, has a policy that sitting presidents cannot be criminally prosecuted. Uh, the state cases, I think uh, it hasn't been decided, but I think state prosecutions also are going to have a very hard time going forward against the sitting president um, because of the federal office that he holds. Uh, these are all unprecedented issues in some ways, but I think uh, in some ways the air is out of the balloon for the uh, legal issue. But if I could just say the other thing which I think Imani was referencing is that those legal issues have now been in some sense voted on in the court of public opinion. And I think there are uh, groups of folks who uh, cannot believe uh, that uh, person who was convicted of felon, uh, who was charged with the uh, crimes that uh, future President Trump was charged with, 
uh, as well as his other legal problems involving sexual assault, uh, it was impossible to imagine that such a person uh, would gain such an incredible electoral victory, and that is exactly what happened. And so I think the legal issues will be quickly shifted into political ones and into policy ones. Jaden Horan, what are your thoughts on that, the fact that uh, this uh, was not a liability for the uh, president uh, or for his candidacy? Um, it seemed that voters were prepared to overlook that. Voters were prepared to overlook it because it felt like a political persecution instead of a prosecution. And, you know, I have to push back on Amani. You know, I, I respect her greatly. You know, we're both educated. And I think that is part of what Trump tapped into is this class divide that exists. The type of rhetoric that we use, the language that we speak with does not is not reflective of other people. And I will say one thing. I think candidate quality matters. Um, to the point uh, in 2016 that she referenced, if we go back to 2008, we have a candidate that is running for office who'd only been elected United States Senator from Illinois for two years before he springboarded to the White House. Now, we could say that it was misogyny that got him there, or we could say it was something else, not qualification, but connection with voters. And that's something that Donald Trump has you know, has demonstrated he's always had. That's something that Joe Biden demonstrated he had. And that's something that Barack Obama and Bill Clinton before him had. And I think that does matter. People want to hear from someone that they could see themselves as, someone that they are reflected in. And, you know, I do believe that the United States will elect a female president, without a doubt. And I believe that person will be reflective of the population yeah. and will be because they are a quality candidate, not because elites chose them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when the American people will get behind it. Imani? I have to agree. Um, I actually 100% agree that what has been Trump's strongest um, point throughout his his 10 years or so in the political atmosphere is his ability to connect. Unfortunately, I think that ability to connect is also speared on fear mongering. It's feared on ex xenophobia. It's feared on um, and spurn um, in ways in which he's able to just really tap into individuals' anxiety and their fears mm -hmm. of othering. And so you're frustrated because the gas prices and grocery prices are skyrocketing. It's someone else's fault. You're frustrated because the industry that you have dedicated 20, 30 years of your life yeah. to is now um, becoming obsolete. So who else can I blame? And so I do believe that that his charisma has been able to capture um, a obviously a you know hundreds um, of millions of people. But I also think it's very interesting for us to to really look yeah. at and say that what happened to women we were where it was about character and qualifications. Yeah. Uh, there was about empathy and other things that, that were also important and not just about how we can play up on the fears um, as a way to galvanize um, our supporters. One other thing, Imani, you know, we actually talked on this show a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the role that the Gaza crisis might play in this yeah, election. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a point at that time, and you said, look, you know, the Gaza crisis is something that could lose the election for Kamala Harris. And if we look at uh, the high turnout from college students, um, I mean, to what extent did Biden-Harris support for Israel uh, contribute to this loss? I think it contributed to the loss because they weren't able to differentiate themselves from from the Trump Vance standpoint, or even going back to um, Trump's previous uh, mm -hmm. support of Benjamin Netanyahu um, and and just the state of Israel. And so I think right, that not abling to to say we are different, Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. She lost this election because she was not able to differentiate herself from not only President Biden, but also to stake the claim that what she was going to do was going to be different, whether it be uh, with foreign policy in the Middle East, in yeah. Europe, in Africa, also what she was able to do differently here in the United States with domestic policies, with the economy, with the border, um, and securing our borders. And so there were a number of, of places where there was just a major misstep, mm -hmm. and, and not differentiating yourself is truly, I believe, what, what cost her those margins yeah. where we saw those numbers come in yesterday. Right. Bill Crane, uh, Trump has promised much on the economy. I mean, let's look at some of the details of that. He talks of tariffs, but, you know, we know that tariffs actually push prices up. Uh, he talks of mass deportations, and there are a number of economists here in the United States who pointed out that the reason we've seen GDP growth, modest GDP growth, uh, is because of the role that um, 
migrants play in, uh, in the manufacturing sector. Um, he wants to cut taxes, uh, but economists again tell us that would push the deficit up something like $4 trillion over the next 10 years. So it's, it's easier said than done, isn't it? His economic package is a hodgepodge. Uh -huh. um, we saw some successes in the revenue generation and some messaging to China on the earlier tariffs that he brought into his first term. Yeah. Joe Biden and his administration didn't take those tariffs away, but they are part of what led to the inflationary spiral that we are still in now, particularly with products that are brought into the United States. And I think that will continue. He's made a proposal about replacing the income tax with tariffs. That's impossible. Um, but I do think there's pent up capital demand potential for growth that was being held back or sitting on the sidelines during this period of indecision. And now that we do know that there's some clarity around who will be running Capitol Hill, both yeah. looks like the Senate obviously is falling into a Republican majority. The U.S. House looks to be heading in that direction. So for two years, you'll have the ability for one party to move pretty yeah. decisively on things like immigration reform, res cutting back on certain regulations that are talking about to get more housing built and some of the other areas that Donald Trump talks about that economists, economists do think might yeah. be helpful. His last tax cuts, particularly as it related to foreign capital stashed overseas, did bring in billions and trillions of dollars to the U.S. economy. So there are some things that he's advocating that do make some sense. And I would point out, because we haven't really given him a whole lot of credit, yeah. there are a whole lot of people who held their nose and voted for Donald Trump. And they were making a choice, a, a series of policy choices. And they were looking at the Biden record and Ms. Harris saying, as you pointed out more than once, she didn't see a whole lot of differentiation or need to put daylight between herself mm -hmm. and the current president of the United States. And that wasn't an answer Americans wanted to hear with a 57 percent disapproval rating. So I think part of the reason for Donald Trump's victory is people remember, perhaps nostalgically and too fondly, the economic side of his presidency yeah. and think he can get us back there. Craig, uh, getting back to the uh, legal problems that Donald Trump is facing, you know, uh, Trump himself, many of his associates see those cases as being politically motivated. Uh, and there is talk of retribution, payback, if you like. I mean, could this get really ugly? It certainly could. But I think that um, uh, for all the talk of uh, Trump's uh, aggression and even uh, some people use words like fascism, I think. Um, in the end, I think he's going to suffer a lot of policy fatigue. If I could just mention two quick things, um, you know, his biggest policy that he put forward was a mass deportation of perhaps one, perhaps 11 million uh, residents of the United States. Uh, that is a policy that he will either try or he won't try. I, I think it's uh, every bit as likely that four years from now we'll look at it as the wall that uh, Mexico was going to pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, if it were to happen, the economic consequences would be very, very severe. And this is what I, I think I meant by the policy, uh, the two-year window that Trump has. Um, he'll be held accountable for that thing. Uh, and uh, whatever it is that he does during that time, uh, uh, I think that the people, any people who might have been holding their nose, they'll have the uh, opportunity to unhold their nose. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, one of the most shocking things I think about the election is that uh, a man who's only singular policy that he could really stand on was mass deportation. His opponent was not able to mobilize that mass deportation as a sledgehammer to ruin his campaign. And the reason is because Donald Trump was very successful on mobilizing images. In Pennsylvania, we see ads, uh, have seen ads all the time on all media, all the time. Uh, and a lot of those ads are built around ideas about race. They're uh, shot in very uh, grim American carnage uh, type of footage. And they're mobilizing ideas of race against uh, immigrants coming across the border is responsible for any range of things, having nothing to do with economics or any other thing. And I think that uh, those policies will either come to fruition or they won't. The economy will turn around, uh, perhaps because of Trump policy, perhaps because of some other reason, or that won't. Uh, and I think that any voters in two years will have that record to look at. It's not common for a president to have the House and the Senate. Uh, mm -hmm. And when those things happen, uh, I think there are real accountability for future elections. Jaden, we've just got a few minutes left, and I want to get to one foreign policy issue, uh, and that is climate change. The United States, of course, joined the Paris Accords. That was back in 2015, when uh, the White House was occupied by President uh, Obama. Then uh, President Trump withdrew from that agreement. Then President Biden got back into the agreement. I mean, it's likely that President uh, Trump will withdraw again from that agreement. Um, I mean, what does that do to U.S 
credibility on the international stage when things like this happen? I mean, when it comes to climate policy, the United States and Republicans in general view it as something that puts national security at risk. It puts our energy uh, independence at risk and kind of, you know, damn what the, uh, the international community thinks about it. Um, Certainly, we all want clean air. We all want clean water. And I believe the, you know, the incoming Trump administration will continue to enforce those regulations that secure that for the American people. Um, as for their, you know, their, how they're viewed in the international community, the, the one thing we do know about uh, former President Trump, soon to be uh, President-elect Trump, is that he doesn't care much what uh, other countries think of us, especially our allies, because they are our friends. Um, and I know that the, the Trump administration will view any cheating by any other countries, yeah. um, those in Asia or Africa or, or South America, and point to that as the reason why they shouldn't be at a competitive disadvantage here in the United States when it comes to um, climate regulations. So uh, I would imagine that would be the argument and kind of, oh, well, to uh, the rest of the world. Yeah. Now, Manny, one other important issue, domestic issue, that I want to talk about before we go, and that is abortion rights. Actually, abortion rights was on the ballot in 10 states during this yes. uh, election. Uh, seven of those states voted for abortion rights, pro-choice, um, which now makes it 14 around the country. Um, how big a role was, was that, that issue, in the election? You know, what we saw yesterday mm -hmm. and what's coming out in these exit polls is that people did what, what a sort of, an, you know, an analysis say is kind of split the ticket, right? Yeah. Where you had that, that issue, whether it be saying, no, I, I do not believe that the government should be telling me what I need to do with my body, and particularly with my body when it comes to my doctor yeah. and my reproductive freedoms. Um, and then you also saw them at the same time um, throw support behind behind Donald Trump. And I think that's something that's really interesting. You look at a state like Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, where my family's from. I went to Washington University in St. Louis. I go to Missouri. I'm going to Missouri on Friday. Um, and it's a, a state that is, you know, similarly talked about it. Like uh, Georgia, you have these kind of blue pockets in these major urban areas. And it was a big deal. And then you saw kind of the flip side of that. So abortion rights, reproductive health care rights, um, still major. Uh, we saw that with the gender uh, divide. But at the same time, um, I don't think it weighed as heavily as individuals were expecting it to um, really weigh out when it looked at who you were blaming um, for the fact that this is even a conversation. And people tend to forget mm -hmm. how we had three Supreme Court justices right. um, put on uh, the courts that then ultimately went to overturn uh, Roe versus Wade. Appointed so, by Trump, yeah. Exactly. So it was, yeah. th there was a little bit of amnesia there mm -hmm. in the voting booth but but it is um, promising to know right. um, that those states um, you know seven out of ten um, I think is significant and so right. we'll see what happens okay and that is where we have to leave it thanks to all of you for being with us that's it for this edition of the heat I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington DC